Welcome to On the Bubble Podcast episode 70. I'm your host, Subasa J. Wait, and with me is my co-host, Yuki Lee Bender. Today, we're going to be doing our first impression on Mist Veil, as we got a bunch of spoiler cards last this weekend. And we're going to be talking about the heroes and their weapons and core gameplay that we can see so far. We don't have the whole set yet, but... We did get a bunch of cards, so we can start talking about this set. Preparation for Calling Tokyo. But before we do that, how was your week, Yuki? My week's been pretty good. Kind of haven't. I haven't really had, like, that much going on. I I leave for Japan. We're recording on Monday the 6th. I leave for Japan tomorrow. I'm not playing the Calling, unfortunately, because family vacation and uh, was not able to make it all work. Uh, So I'm a little bit disappointed about that, but... It is what it is. It should be fun regardless. I'm there for about two and a half weeks. Um, so should be a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I've mostly just been focused on like getting ready for my trip and all of that and keeping up with spoilers. But I haven't actually been playing too much Flesh and Blood. Been working a little bit on some content, some coaching. Yeah, that's about it. How's your week been? Yeah, same. We didn't have a pro quest this weekend in our local area. I think the closest one was like six or seven hours drive away and you know i didn't want to do it for cc if it was draft man may have done the trip like but for cc i'm not that interested so no i'm just waiting for part the mistville to come out at this point yeah i looked on the like event finder and i'm like oh there's none and then i looked at the filter and i'm like oh wait i have to increase the radius or like the distance and then i increased it to 250 and it's like oh there's still none like 250 kilometers and then i went to 500 and then there was one within 500 kilometers down in like portland and i was just like i don't know if this is worth it and somebody was like you could fly to uh you could fly to alberta and I was like, oh, that's true. I could spend like $100 and fly to Alberta for a pro quest when I'm qualified and leaving in a couple of days <laughs> <laughs> uh, for another trip. So yeah, not 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 the most appealing. Um, that being said, maybe a good segue. Thank you to all of our patrons. I've actually been seeing a lot of patrons that took the Savage Sash KO list that I posted on the Patreon with a sideboard guide to their pro quest saying that they did very well. Uh, a number of top eights. I believe somebody top eighted a battle hardened or P- or pro quest plus event. One of the two, the one in um, gosh, where was it? Richmond, the one in Richmond. Also seen like a number of people like win their pro quest on the deck, including teammate Jimmy Nguyen. So congrats to Jimmy and congrats to everyone else who's been doing well. Pretty curious to see the stats on this week's pro quests because i feel like a lot of people anecdotally have been going oh my goodness savage sash ko is insane deck is so good uh not not just like mine like 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 the deck is like not rocket science like it's it's very much like the old ko shell with like some of the new cards slotted in but yeah there's been like a lot of people like very concerned about this chess piece and i'm pretty curious to see like how the results for the first week will translate is there way more ko winning than before is it just like a little bit all that will be super super interesting to see when they post the metagame minute and the living legend update yeah no i'm also curious too did you already get your copy of the ko armory deck no i'm getting one basically i kind of dropped the ball on on getting one i asked invasion my sponsor about it and uh they said that they're probably getting more in so they've set one they're gonna set one aside for me and put it in with um when I get my my MST stuff because uh I'm not gonna be really playing flesh and blood for a little while. It's kinda weird and just like have this like forced two and a half break where I'm in Japan but not playing the calling. So uh I don't know. I'll keep up with spoilers. I'll probably be doing some content still, but uh but yeah, I'm not really gonna be playing, so I don't really need cards until the new set drops. Yeah, no, enjoy your vacation. It's um you, you deserve a two week break at this point. <laughs> I guess so. It's sort of weird. Like you you would think that I'd be like, Oh yeah, I got a break. This is great. But I'm sort of just like kinda wish I was just like keeping up with spoilers, working on new decks, trying to like break the limited format before the world premiere. Like that all sounds so fun. And this set looks we'll we'll get into talking about the set, but I'm pretty excited about this set. This set looks really sweet. Yeah. I think, I don't know, I've posted like a little bit on Twitter about feeling like the format while very open is like very 
kind of like value oriented mid range soupy, not a lot of on hits and uh, not a lot of like forced interaction. Like a lot of decks like blocking, but they're like blocking to increase the value of their hand, not blocking because they're like opponents making them block. Because like even like Hatchet Story is very like a uh, like it's a deck that blocks, and you could like maybe call it interactive. But the deck kind of is just, just like they're doing its own thing. It's just like I'm doing a bit of blocking. I'm like swinging my hatchets and getting value. Uh, I'll see if it's good enough. You're not really like it's kind of weird. You like kind of don't care about what your opponent is doing, even though you're doing some amount of attacking and blocking. It's 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 odd. And then here comes new, and every single card that we read so far is basically an on hit. And it's not that impactful for most of them, but, you know, a lot of these stealth cards are going to have some nice on hits on them. And she can get goal again. I think that's the biggest thing that was, like, missing for me with Assassin. Who, who knew? I tend to like slightly more aggressive decks. But yeah, like, the on hits with the goal agains is, like, oh, it's so good. It, it reminds me of... It kind of reminds me of like Lexi almost, where you just like present a bunch of on hits, you have some combat tricks, you have go again, and you can go wide. You can occasionally go tall as well, and you're just like kind of super annoying for your opponent. I'm excited for that gameplay again. Okay, then. you want to get right into it then? Yeah, yeah, let's jump on into the uh, to our main topic, which is our first impressions on the new MST cards. Um, basically, the blitz deck videos just got posted last night for us so all of these cards are like pretty fresh we've i i've watched i think like two out of the three videos and kind of like looked through all the spoilers in pretty decent detail but that that's about it it's still like pretty early for us with these spoilers but um yeah we got a whole bunch of new cards super exciting uh what hero do you want to start with let's start off with the new because you know what we've we've been talking about it already um, so I'll be reading the Young Hero versions. There's not that much of a difference other than their health, um, but just, just as a note, we'll be talking about it in the limited lens uh, mainly first. So New reads, Your attack with stealth gets when this chain link resolve banish all action cards defending this. And has a second ability, instant and pay... How do we want to call this res- new resource? Chi? Yeah, pay three chi, I guess. Yeah, pay three chi. Look at the top card of an opposing hero's deck. If it's a blue, you may banish it. Until end of turn, you may play blue cards from that hero's banish zone without paying their resource cost. And she's obviously a four intellect with 20 elf. Yep. And then we, of course, need to talk about our weapon as well. We actually saw like an early leak of this weapon and people weren't sure if it's real. Turns out it was real. Um, called Beckoning Mistblade. It is a one-handed mystic assassin weapon dagger, um, and it attacks for one, just like all the other daggers, and has an activation cost of two and go ag- and has go again. Um, it says, when this hits, your next blue attack this turn gets plus one attack and go again. Um, so kind of like leaning into that theme of like playing your opponent's blues and blues matters. Also notably, it doesn't have piercing. So unlike all the other daggers that have piercing one, Beckoning Mistblade does not have Piercing 1, so might come up in Limited. I don't know if we have that much armor that blocks. There's like a little bit, but there's a lot of like prevention armor and stuff. There's a there's a good amount of Blade Break 1s, I think. A blade Break and Battle Sworn 1s. Okay, okay. So yeah, just keep in mind that you, you, you can block this dagger with your equipment, unlike the other Assassin daggers. Um, yeah, fair enough. So I guess let's start with just talking about News Ability real quick. Her ability to pay three chi and play blues off of your opponent's banish zone. Like the first time I read this card, I thought it was just like, oh, you ha- you have to play the blue card you've banished, uh, like off its off this ability. But that's not the case. You can play any blue cards that you've banished throughout the game, and it doesn't matter how you've banished the card. Like it doesn't matter if they banish the card. It doesn't matter if you banish the card. As long as it's in their banish zone, you get to play it. If you've activated this, and not only you get to play one, you get to play all their blues on that turn if they have go again. Yeah, so you can play as many blues as you like, notably like rules interaction thing. Um, And they talk about this in the dev videos too. But if you play like one of the transcend instants from their banish zone, because those are blues, you can play them, uh, you will get the effect. But if you transcend because you've played another blue this turn, 
which I think you like have to have transcended because you're using her ability. I guess it's like technically possible not to. But anyways, if you transcend playing that card, they get the inner chi back to their hand. So typically you're not going to want to play the the transcend cards that you banish off your opponent's zone, although technically you can. So like, I don't know, there's like a plus one attack one. So like maybe you can play that as a reaction if it's like lethal or something. But typically you won't want to do that um, just as like a thing to keep in mind. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. So transcend means that it goes back to the owner's hand. And yeah, I think keep that in mind because like, you know, if you give Enigma three chi, that means she gets the spectral shield. So it's just a block for one. Yeah. And I think especially in the limited context, like this ability is super powerful. This is like the blues matter set. And we've seen like early on in spoiler season, a whole bunch of the like blue cards where like if you've played a blue or if you've transcended, they get plus power. And they're basically just like on rate blues. Like we have like the second tenet of Chi Tide, which is just a blue three for five that blocks three. And if you've transcended, it gets plus two. So it's just a three for seven. Um, and the fact that you can just like play a free three for seven from your opponent's banish is like pretty crazy. There's like Droplet, where if you've played another blue, it gets plus two and its base is two power. So it's just a zero for four at blue. And there's there's a whole cycle. Of these. There's like a one for five, a two for six and a three for seven if you've uh, if you've played another blue. And all of those just seem like super, super powerful. So I think like within the context of this set, especially new is really strong. And then um, her dagger has natural synergy with that because it's just all that, all that the dagger cares about is the next blue attack this turn that you play or your next blue attack this turn gets plus one. So like even if you play an opponent's blue card from their banish zone, the da- if, if you've hit with the dagger, that blue card is going to get go again and then you can play more blue cards. Um, so it, it can get pretty powerful. Like the, the ceiling on this ability is like super, super high, basically. I want to talk about some of her common attacks, honestly, just like assassin attacks that she gets. I'm not sure if this is a cycle, but basically all the assassin attacks are stealth attacks. Um, A lot of them seems to cause zero so far, and they attack for three, but they also just have the line of text. Almost all of them have the line of text of when this here, when this hits a hero, bench the top card of their deck um, and banish and some of them, the rare ones at least, will say then banish a card from their graveyard. So you actually get to choose and pick like blues that like they decided not to block with to for it to get banished from news effect. If you just attack with her regular assassin attacks, you just get to banish off the top card of their deck and their graveyard if they choose not to block any attacks from new. So like you almost always get access to blue cards from your opponent too it is very hard for them to stop because like if they block a stealth card with an action that gets banished if the action hit if the stealth card hits it banishes the top card and like maybe a card from graveyard so you're just like so likely especially since these decks seem to be wanting to play like a decent number of blues for the transcend cards you would assume this is pretty powerful and something that I didn't realize when I was reading these cards and assessing them initially is that the effects on them work from news ability too. So for example, um, like I think a really premium one is Art of Desire Body. This is a zero for three at red. We don't know if it comes in other colors. It has stealth and it says when this hits a hero, banish the top card of their deck. Whenever this banishes a red card, draw a card and gain one life. Um, so this one actually has like the draw a card clause attached to it which is like super super powerful but what i didn't realize is like if they block this with a red card news ability will banish the red card and then you'll draw a card and if they block this with a blue card you get a blue card to play later and if they don't block this you banish the top card of their deck and it's either like a blue card you can play later or a red card and you draw a card and gain a life Um, oh i didn't even realize this either this new reads your attacks with stealth get so Oh, it's the attack that actually gets the ability. It's not new that has this ability strapped on. Yeah, so like a lot of these, like you might put your your opponent in a situation where like if they block it, you gain the life. And if they don't block it, you gain the life. And there's also like the world where they block it, you gain a life. And then you play an attack reaction and go over and then you hit like another card and like gain like another life. So like some of these might be giving you like one to two life gain like pretty consistently depending on 
I think like depending on uh, the trigger condition as well as like your opponent's deck in hand, but it's like pretty hard to get around, honestly. Yeah, no, I didn't realize this either. But holy, that's that's a lot more triggers. That that's a lot easier to trigger all of these abilities now that I understood what these cards do. Yeah, I, I didn't realize it either. And someone pointed out to me, and I was like, holy, that's insane. So it's like very, very cool and very synergistic with um, her attack reactions, which maybe we can also touch on. Mystic Assassin has some like super, super premium attack reactions. These are crazy at common. Uh, the ones that are particularly impressive to me are Hiss. At red, this is a one for th- three attack action that can target an uh, Assassin or Mystic attack action card. And it says if you pitched a blue card this turn, create a Slither in your hand and it blocks three. So already at its face, one for three that blocks three, pretty decent. And then you also get another attack reaction in your hand called Slither. And Slither is a zero cost attack reaction that says target attack action gets a go again. And it also has uh, ephemeral. So um, it can't, like if it goes into your graveyard, it just gets removed from the game instead. But the notable thing about Slither is like, of course, like, so like Hiss is like a one for three go again attack reaction that blocks three which is like crazy but you can also potentially arsenal the slither um for a following turn and save it so if you can't if you can't use the go again on that turn you can potentially put slither in arsenal then you have this like face up go again in your arsenal that your opponent has to consider and i think you can create some pretty nasty situations with it she has other ways to make these attack reactions as well but um these seem like really core to her gameplay loop and i think that like it also has natural synergy with her hero ability because you can slither any type of attack action. So if you like steal your opponent's blues, you can potentially like slither the opponent's blue, give it go again, play more blues from their banish zone if they don't have ones that have go again already. So yeah, Hiss is like super premium, and I think Venomous Bite also is. It's almost the same card. It's also a one for three attack action, but it gives them it gives you a Fang Strike in hand, which is just a plus one. Target attack, action, tar- target attack action card gets plus one. It's basically like a lunging press that you can't pitch. I didn't realize that you can arsenal these tokens. Um, I just thought you had to use them, but yeah, you, yeah, that kind of blows my mind. Yeah, they go to your hands. So that means you can arsenal it, and they don't disappear in your arsenal. They only disappear once you've played it. Honestly, it sounds so annoying to like attack with a stealth card, venomous bite it over, then just like put the fang strike in your arsenal, then attack them with another stealth card for three and be like, do you want to block this? And they're like, no, <laughs> like not really. Oh, wow. That's that's just gross. Holy, I did not realize that was the interaction with these like new type of tokens. Also kind of sweet that in Constructed, you can uh, technically bottom these cards with Enlightened Strike. You you will like draw them later potentially, which is like interesting. So you technically would want them in like the same sleeve as your deck if you're doing that. It's interesting that you can do it. Getting 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 a free piece of cardboard is like we don't have that many effects that care about it, but it it's like typically a pretty powerful effect in card games because like anything that just cares about like a card, if you just like have a card that generates another free card and is just like worth a card on its own, it's like pretty it's interesting. Yeah, no, that is interesting. There's not that many generics that just, like, care about having a card. It's not like, you know, we're Reinhardt. It's like an extra cost to discard a card to play a card, things like that. So if it was that kind of case where mm-hmm. you, like, attack with a card like uh, Wrecker Romp and discard a Fang Strike, that's kind of sick, too. Yeah, it's very, very cool. So it seems like what New wants to be doing is, like, kind of in limited anyways, and probably constructed, too, is, like, play these nasty stealth effects and push them over with attack reactions and use those to banish her opponent's blues and then hopefully uh, play her opponent's blues by either like they have natural go again or giving them go again with beckoning misblade or the um or the slither tokens that she's able to generate in a number of ways she even has like equipment that generates slither tokens which are the which are super good by the way so if you're playing limited you you these read powerful, so I don't think people will miss them. But Undertow Stilettos is a leg piece, one one block battle war in one. And it says, uh, attack reaction one, destroy this, create a slither in your hand. So this is like an attack. This is like a, this is almost like a Sutcliffe's from Tails, except you can block with it once. So you can like block one and then pay one, give something go again, essentially, which is just like super, super good. 
if you can't use the go again and you have like an extra resource, you can just like do that and Arsenal the Slither, also super good. So these are really good. And there's there's a similar one for the arms spot called a rousing wave that has the same text battle war in one, but it makes a fang strike as the attack reaction. So yeah, super premium equipment. They seem really good. Yeah, super good, super good. Also have natural synergy. We can move on from new in a moment, but has natural synergy with another card that looks pretty premium in her. It's a rare. It's called Double Trouble. This is a zero for three stealth. And it says if you played or activated two or more attack reactions, this chain link, this gets plus two. And when this hits a hero, banish the top two cards of their deck. So if you enable this uh, by playing two attack reactions, this is a zero for five and it banishes the top two cards of their deck. Zero for five, very, very good. Banishing cards is what you want to be doing anyways. And um, <clears throat> notably, because Hiss and, and Venomous Bite create the like Fang Strike or Slither token in your hand, those are two attack reactions all on their own. And uh, the equipment are also actually two attack reactions as well, because it's a reaction to create the token, and then you get the token, which is another reaction. So like your undertow stilettos can turn on double trouble all by itself, which seems really good. Yeah, it does seem really good. It's um, It essentially turns this card into a one cost six stealth card, which which is all, like above rate, just straight up above rate. Um, seems like there's a lot of stuff you can do in this set that is just either on rate or above rate. So I don't know if this set will come down to fatigue that often, even if you have to play exactly 30 cards. Oh, I guess that's a, it's, it's a note that we should just add on right now is, um, at least for sealed, we do know that you have to play exactly 30 cards in your deck. You get eight packs to make these 30 card decks. So it's going to be... The card quality in your decks is going to be kind of high, and I kind of doubt you'll have to play that many yellows in the sealed format. Yeah, I think if you're playing yellows, it's probably because they're good cards. There's, you're probably not going to be like forced to play yellows, or like maybe the rest of your pool is really good and you need like one or two yellow filler cards. But um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think you're going to mostly be able to avoid playing yellows unless you like want to be playing them actively, which is. Pretty cool. I think I think this format's going to be really really fun. Um, and I agree that fatigue seems like pretty hard to get to, especially with like new just like banishing stuff and getting to play a bunch of it if the game goes long enough. Like new seems like close to unfatigable. Maybe she can fatigue her opponents by just like banishing their stuff and playing her blues. Um, but I think she can also just kill you with damage. Like she has like the um, the warrior end game with these like all the attack reactions that is just sort of like. I don't know. Once you're at three, do you want to give me cards forever? Or do you want to just like die to my attack reaction? She has that kind of gameplay going on for sure. Yeah, I think it's going to be like fatigue by damage, if anything. But yeah, she's not she's not trying to block you out and like fatigue you. I think she's going to be like, oh, I'm going to be playing these on rate cards. Give me, you know, like just give me more cards from your deck or hand, no matter what happens. And if you like start like over blocking these to play around my attack reactions, I might like gain multiple life points kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's so gross. Any other cards you want to touch on before we move on to our next hero? Not really. I want to say that um, this is probably the class I'm most excited for in Constructed. Maybe. I'm also really excited for Enigma, but um, I think... This kind of almost gives me like Lexi vibes a little bit, just in terms of having a whole bunch of on hits, having some tricks to push it over and being able to go wide. I feel like Assassin was like super close to where I wanted it to be before, but I always was like, ah, I want more go again in this deck and new seems to get a whole bunch of go again. And something I think that's really sick for Constructed is the possibility of flick knives with Beckoning Misblade, because Beckoning Misplayed is like also a hit effect. So if you flick knives, you get the effect and you can potentially play like, like you can potentially just like, I don't know, like against KO, if you have like, if you, if you transcend and you, you, you might be able to like play a blue slither it from a slither that you had from a previous turn, flick your Beckoning Misplayed, play another blue. It has go again from the Beckoning Misplayed, then play another blue. So that just means like if you transcend, you can just get like, 10 to 15 damage out of like chaos blues for example which seems like really really cool or if it's like against a guardian it's like even more gross you can just play like three thunderquakes and they're sad 
So I think Nuke can do some like really cool stuff and constructed with flick knives, especially. I'm just excited to see somebody get Mucho grande um against, you know, when they're playing against Nu, because they're just like, oh, I have I'm playing Mucho Grandes because they're like one of the best blues for Guardian right now. And then they're just like zero cost mucho grande dominate it has terra asunder and go again <laughs> oh my god you can play terra asunder mucho grande for free that's so sick yeah and you can give it go again and then hit them with more big attacks once they've discarded their hand wow that's uh you can slither it you can slither it and then f- and then flick knives your beckoning misplayed and then play like two more eights like it's like gross like like the things that new can do is like pretty crazy um i don't know what she's gonna do against like warrior necessarily who like doesn't have like she like new doesn't banish banish reactions she only banishes actions with her ability and then like warrior has a bunch of reactions and i don't even know if they're like that good when you ban- like if you get like a glint is that good i don't think that's very good <laughs> well glint still draws a card so if they block from hand on your dagger <laughs> yeah okay yeah okay so, so there's definitely some questions but uh th- this hero looks super fun I'm, I'm excited yeah i think a lot of her cards are just on raid in general that it might be it might just be good enough it seems like she can just kind of like hit people which is really cool yeah we still don't know all of her cards yet and we're missing a bunch of majestic still so you know what some, some, maybe some kind of broken majestic comes out for her and she goes over the top but we don't know that yet, but because we only basically have the Blitz deck cards, and those are mainly commons and rares. Something I've been wondering about for a while, but I'm starting to feel more and more like we won't get it, is I almost wonder if we get like, like almost like a painter servant style effect where like you can like change the color of a card. It'd be very interesting. I, I don't know if we'll actually get it because like being able to play a red or like any card from your opponent's Spanish probably is like a little too strong, but it'd be very very cool. That, that seems really, really strong, and that might just be too good. I'll be honest, I wouldn't even, like, put it past it for them to, like, print a legendary Majestic that, like, does exactly what you just said. So, like, in Constructed, like, you you just get to have a pop-off turn where you just, like, play, like, five or six reds from your opponent. Well, I don't know if it would, like, I don't know if it would, like, make, like, all reds blues, but, like, maybe you can make, like, one red into a blue. Oh, that's kind of interesting. It, it's like something I kind of wondered about for a while with her, if it's like something that she can do, but but I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. It's all speculation. We have like no Majestics at all, so all the heroes are kind of like in their more most basic form. But I mean, like these Blitz decks are usually designed to kind of show people's at least like some of the core gameplay from the heroes. So I think that it's probably like fairly representative of the heroes um, yeah. and what they're trying to do, but they probably just have some like splashy m's that do some really powerful stuff honestly these blitz decks are great for us limited players because Mm -hmm. we kind of get to see a lot of what they can do let's move on and talk about enigma next so this is the second hero from the set this is a mystic illusionist hero and she reads your first spectral shield attack each turn costs one resource less to activate and then she also has once per turn instant Pay three chi, create a spectral shield token with a plus one counter. So we kind of didn't know what this meant or what this can do until we just got her weapon card, and that's Cosmo's Scroll of Ancestral Tapestry. This card is an illusionist weapon, so technically Prism can play it as well now, um, but it's a two handed scroll which also reads, during your turn, or as you control with ward, are weapons with base power equal to their ward. And they get once per turn action, pay one resource to attack. It has a second in line ability, says your aura attacks with one or more plus one counters get to go again. Yeah, so notably, um, her first spectral shield attack is free. If it is a transcended spectral shield, it will have a, at least plus one, one plus one counter on it. So we'll have go again as well. Yeah, it seems like new, uh, sorry, it seems like Enigma is kind of built to like play these wards and attack with you, attack with them. And it seems like she has like a lot of ways to play ward at instant speed. And there's sort of like a blending of 
your turn and their turn and your attacking phase and your blocking phase because like if you're playing a ward card and then attacking them with it it also has like blocking implications on your next turn so um enigma seems really really cool and almost gives me like icelander vibes uh, and before people groan, like, I don't think it's the, the parts of Icelander that a lot of people objected to, like having like instant speed Janna, like Frigid, instant speed hypothermia. Like she's not doing that, but I just mean in terms of the like frequently playing on your opponent's turn and like playing this kind of like value game where you play on both turns and you can sort of like set up a like, I pass and do nothing. I have a big turn on my turn, hit you with a bunch of wards and then like on my next turn, I can either like play more wards on your turn or block to protect my board or like do other things. You, you kind of like get to like have like the two turns in a row kind of thing almost it feels like. Yeah, I agree. I think Enigma has the biggest potential for having like the biggest turns um, over two turn cycles. Mm -hmm. It's if she gets to play like three auras, because it seems like a lot of her instants are very cheap, uh, unlike Prism's auras, which cost four. Enigma's auras seems to cost anywhere between zero and three, which is significantly easier to play than the four costs. Yeah, and something that we saw Jason doing, uh, the dev Jason doing in the Blitz deck gameplay was like sometimes playing multiple of these like pitching a blue and playing multiple of them because some of them also have effects that care if you've like played a blue or pitched a blue um so it's pretty interesting let's let's read a couple of these for the viewers just to give some um idea of what we're talking about sure let's uh talk about waxing specter this is my favorite card and this is a looks like a common from this set it is a two cost mystic illusionist instant aura and it reads, if you've pitched a blue card this turn, this enters the arena with a plus one counter. Ward three. Very simple card. How does this card play in the game? So I think the common play pattern with this card, there's going to be multiple ways that you can play these cards always. But a common play pattern with this card is going to be pitch a blue, play it on your turn. It comes down with a plus one counter on it, and you have one resource floating, which you can then spend on Cosmo, and that will make it attack for four. So it's kind of like a three for four go again, but then you also get the ward three, which blocks three. So this is just like a two card seven that has go again. So you can still follow this up with something afterwards if you if you have extra cards, or you can play it as a two card hand. It's very modal. And um, the thing about this two card seven that like we already know from heavy hitters two card seven very good baseline but what's really intriguing about this is as soon as this sticks for one turn you have a one for four weapon that has go again and a one for four go again weapon is just like crazy and i think that that's sort of like the theme with a lot of these enigma cards is that if a lot of them are sort of like on rate as a like two card play but they're factored for like one attack and one ward. And anytime you get multiple wards, it becomes like exponentially more powerful. Um, another example of this is we have Waning Vengeance. This is a one cost ward three. And it says uh, at red, and it says um, when this leaves the arena, if you've, cr if you've pitched a blue card, create a spectral shield token. So on its face, this is kind of like a two for six, right? You attack for three, you ward three. And then uh, if you've pitched a blue on your, uh, when, it, when it's popped, you get a spectral shield token. So, so some of this like encouraging playing these instants on your opponent's turn to get the blue pitch in, in the zone to get the, the effect online. So some of the cards are like that. That's kind of gross. Yeah. Because like... If you have multiple instants in a blue, I guess you can like play the Waning Vengeance, block for three, leak some damage, and then after the attack resolves, you can play your other instance with your floating resource. So you can like make sure some of the ward sticks and the other wards don't. It's, that's kind of interesting too. Yeah. And the the Waning Vengeance leaving behind the Spectral Shield means that like at base value like if if you if you're if you like block slash ward with your whole hand and you, the waning vengeance is one of the last things to pop you will still get the spectral shield token which can then attack for free on your turn with cosmo 
Yeah, very interesting. And and it's an instant. So like you can't just like block with this card and and same thing with Waxing Spectre. That's also an instant aura that has ward. So th there's some of these cards that like do defend, but you kind of have to play them to defend and you don't get the luxury of like also having them be a three block, which seems to be a, a balancing mechanism around these because they're they're very, very strong cards, I think. Another one that seems to be kind of key and is a similar style card is Haze Shelter. This is also an instant speed aura, so it doesn't block. And it costs two, and it has Ward X at red. And it says X is four if you've pitched a blue card this turn. Otherwise, X is one. So if it's on its own, it's just a Ward one. But if you pitched a blue card, it's Ward four. Notably, this is sort of like a two card eight, because if you play it on your turn pitching a blue and attack with it, it attacks for four, and then it has like a ward four on the back end. But the ward four is only active if you've pitched a blue on their turn. So if they attack you into this and you don't have a good way to pitch blue cards and spend resources on this effect, it will actually only be a ward one and it will lose a significant amount of its value. So um, it does seem like the cards kind of like encourage you to pitch and play on your opponent's turn to some degree. But I think you're also going to have to at times choose to take damage and let them knock down your board because you can't protect it and then um, and then build it back up. So I think Enigma is going to have a lot of interesting play of like, do I preserve my board and try and just like lock them out with my board? Or do I let that go and play like more of a value game? And she seems to be very fluid between like being able to play both of those styles. Uh, one note about Enigma is a lot of her cards do not block that well. So I have a feeling that Enigma is going to be wanting a lot of three blocks in their illusionist actions not the mystic illusionist cards but the illusionist action cards some a lot of them do actually block instead of their instead of the instants that have no blocks so it'll be an interesting factor to see how many cards that actually block you need in your deck to make this to make this deck function in limited we don't actually know the numbers yet but once we do we will we'll let you guys know as soon as possible the divide here seems to be that the cards that don't block are the instants with ward. So you can play these out potentially in multiples and attack with them on the turn that they come down. So they're much better aggressive cards. And then I think I'm pretty sure all of the illusionist cards that we've seen in the set um, that do block are mostly auras or they make auras, but they don't have go again. So to give you an example, we have um, Astral Etchings, which is a illusionist action that blocks for three and costs one. And says, put three plus one counters on target aura with ward you control. If you control a spectral shield, you may play this as though it were an instant. So this one does allow you to play it as an instant if you have a spectral shield. But otherwise, it's just an action that puts down uh, counters. And you have to like get, that, get to your next turn to get the attack out of it. We also see... Um, some other examples like uh, Essence of Ancestry Mind, which is a zero for three, uh, zero cost block three that has Ward two, and it says when this leaves the arena, if you control no illusion auras, the next time you'll be dealt damage by a blue source this turn, prevent it. So um, has the upside of blocking three and being like a zero for two, a zero zero for Ward two, which seems super super strong. But the downside is this takes an action to play, and so you don't get the attack value until the following turn, and it's a little bit harder to leverage that way. So there seems to be this balancing act between having instants that allow you to attack the turn that you play them, and also allow you to like use a four card hand if your opponent leaves you alone, but then also wanting to have these blocking cards so that you don't just explode and you don't have to be like stuck playing like one or two resources to like block three with your like ward three instant <laughs> it's like not really what you want to be doing like you really want to be getting the attack out of those first cards that we read out or they're not very good yes that's very fair what's kind of interesting when you we look at the at least the first couple of cards that's been released is not that many cards block in this set this is like a weird set where a lot of the mystic instants don't block a lot of or all you know all the mystic illusionist cards so far doesn't block and then because we have ninjas they also block for two and assassin is the only one that i guess like a decent amount of three blocks so this will be this is similar to heavy hitters in the sense of like a lot of these cards seem to attack better than they block 
And this is also the reason why I said earlier that I don't know if we are going to get to these like fatigue spots because a lot of these cards are just better offensively than defensively. Yeah, I think this is something LSS has kind of realized and I think has like, I don't want to like say has come up in dev talks, but I think that they've touched on this point to some degree that they've kind of realized that like one way to get around fatigue being super prominent, like you think like Teclo fatigue and bright lights is by lowering the block value on cards because when everything is a three block and you have like a, especially if you have a good weapon, it just kind of like in there's like always going to be like that fatigue deck in there. That's like pretty decent. But when you have like a bunch of cards that don't necessarily block as well as they attack, um, it encourages more proactive gameplay. So I kind of feel like LSS is leaning into this a lot in heavy hitters in this set. And I kind of expect to continue to see that. Um, it's possible to shake up the formula at some point, but um kind of seems to be like the new direction for limited anyways you know what that's fair i kind of like it so it's same i feel like it makes more interesting gameplays than just blocking for nine every turn yeah i think the like block for nine swing hammer gameplay is uh it's okay but it can get stale we've seen it we've seen like analogs to that in like a number of sets and i think if they want to encourage people to play their cards, um, th- this makes a ton of sense. And and I, I think it's like more interesting when you want to play your cards. You're not just like using your cards for their block and their pitch value. What? I don't agree with that. Blocking for nine is playing <laughs> your cards. You're, you're playing them as a three blocks. That's why you put them in the deck because they block for three. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so Jay and I have a lot of different opinions on this, but... Yeah, like, where else can you play Comp to Fight and Constructed if it wasn't a 3-block? Like, you just never get to play that card. It's true, it's true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a little more to say. Enigma has, like, some cool equipment available to her. Notably, um, Uphold Tradition in the arm slot is... We should actually talk about this. There, there's a new keyword in the equipment that I think, like, not all, but a lot of the equipment in this set seems to have. It's called Cloaked. And Cloaked says this equip this face down. So basically at the start of your at the start of the game, you put all your equipment face down and the cloak cards just like stay face down. You never flip them up. And um, they all have like a way to flip them up later when they're relevant. The gloves I want to talk about are uphold tradition. They're cloaked, so they cut, they start face down, and they have an instant one resource. Turn this face up, put a plus one counter on an aura you control with ward, and the gloves have ward one themselves, so they can also help defend. I think if you are playing limited, this is going to be super, super, super important because effectively what this does is not only does it let you translate one damage into a plus one counter on your aura, which might stick around and it's just a damage and has ward one, so good value already. But the plus one counter is going to give your aura go again. So you can just do so much more when you have like an onboard way to give your thing a plus one counter and go again. And then like it also protects that aura a little bit by providing you with ward one. Um, so I think that this is going to be a key piece of equipment that you probably really want to see if you're playing Enigma. And if you're playing against an Enigma and they have cloaked gloves, you need to be aware that this card could be a trick that they might play against you. There are other cloaked equipment, so they might not have it, but you need to be aware that it's at least an option. One of the first cards in the arm slot that basically gives go again, isn't it? I think so, because usually that's reserved to the boots. So it's pretty, it's, it's, it's quite powerful, honestly. Yeah, no, it's super powerful. And the grossest part about this is like, the cloaked arm piece, the other one that's been spoiled so far, is called Waves of the Aquamarine, which is a Mystic Equipment Arms, which Enigma can also play. And this is just an attack reaction, pay one turn it face up to um, target attack gets plus one power. So, like, no matter what, if they have a cloaked arm piece, at least for now, it will get the power. But then if it's Uphold Tradition, they also get Go Again with it, which is, like, a significant upgrade. Yeah, it is a significant upgrade. It is very good. There there actually is one that doesn't do that. There's the Skyhold Keikoi. Um it's a has a it's also cloaked and it has instant destroy this, prevent the next one damage that would be dealt to you this turn, activate only while this is face down. Oh, I didn't realize. Yes, yes. The the text on it is also super fascinating. 
it's saying activate this ability only while this is face down. It leads me to believe that there has to be a way to flip these over or they're at least or like maybe they're like future proofing design for that. But like it kind of sounds like there's a way to like flip these over. Like, so I wonder if there's like something that has like an on hit where you like choose an equipment and like flip it face up. That would be interesting. I'm not sure if that's going to be part of the set, but maybe, you know what? I can't. We haven't seen the whole set yet, so I can't say that yet. Yeah, it's just interesting that they like specify that because the card destroys itself and it comes in face down. So you don't even have a way to flip this face up. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So it is sort of like, why is this a thing? And like a lot of them have like a cost associated with them that is flip the card face up. So it's like, it's kind of interesting. I kind of wonder if there's something that interacts with these cards. Yeah, I kind of doubt it, but maybe honestly, if if they if they add it, I wouldn't be too surprised. If they don't add anything, I wouldn't be surprised either. Anything else you want to talk about Enigma before we move on? I'm pretty interested in this car in this hero uh, in limited, but I'm also interested in her in constructed. I think she's going to have some cool synergy with some of the existing uh, cards, and when you combine her with like with some of the blue auras, it's going to be pretty powerful. Like um, in particular. Haze Bending and Shimmers of Silver both just seem like pretty crazy in this deck because most of the ward cards are still auras. So then like Haze Bending makes it so like when one dies, you get a Spectral Shield, which is a nuisance. And Shimmers gives them the plus one counter, which also gives them go again. And I think the tension between like clearing these Spectra cards and trying to deal with her ward is going to be really powerful. Yeah, I forgot that there's a aura that gives a plus one counter to whenever. Is it whenever whenever the first aura attacks? Is that what it was? Yeah, the first aura that attacks gets a plus one counter, which also means it will get go again. And then if you want to clear the shimmers out, then like you kind of can't deal with the ward, or like it's harder to deal with the ward. But it's it's pretty cool. I think she's gonna be uh, really really interesting. She also has like the like some like old cards like. Um, crown of reflection that lets you break a spectral shield and put an aura into play is just like or sorry what does it let you do i think it lets you like break an aura and put an aura with the same cost into play destroy target illusionist aura you control if you do you may put an illusionist aura from your hand into the arena with cost less than or equal to the aura destroyed this way activate only if crown of reflection is only activate crown of reflection only during your action phase um, but like potentially a way to like put in a shimmers for like a spectral shield and then attack and stuff gets go again and like I don't know could be pretty interesting. I still feel like balance of justice just might be better. It might depend on the matchup, yeah. Yeah, or even like a crown of providence. It's just so hard to compete in the headpiece and constructed. They have to do something really special for for you to want to play, not balance of justice. I guess there's also like the weird like diadem of dream state, the like ward two headpiece where once per turn when this or a non-token permanent you control with ward is destroyed, you may pay a resource if you do create a ponder token. It's like fragile because it breaks as soon as they get through your ward. But like, I don't know. It triggers off of itself and can draw you a card. So if it's like two life, pay one draw a card, it's like not terrible. And if you keep this around like if you keep this around for like a couple turns, it will get out of control pretty fast. So I kind of wonder like how gross the Enigma going first with like Diadem and like, like if Enigma goes first and has like Diadem of Dream State and like the, what are the gloves? The Spectral Shield, Wave of Reality. And they play like Ward, like, I don't know how much Ward you can play, but if they play like Ward 6 or Ward 8, it's like, sounds scary. <laughs> sounds really scary. Yeah, that does sound kind of gross. And you know what my favorite part about Enigma is for Constructed? It starts with 40 health. Mm -hmm. There's a very powerful line of text on this card. 40 health as an illusionist is a lot of health. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I think Enigma could be pretty strong. I I hope that the like turn zero ward high roll isn't too gross. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. The, the, the word values are not super high. So, like, maybe it's just fine. I think the grossest part is that, like, if Enigma goes, like, Ward 4 plays a Spectra, that's that's when it starts to go, like, oh, my God, how do I beat this? I feel like if it's, like, Ward 7 or Ward 8, it's, like, 
acceptable it's like not the best but like it's acceptable but once you start to put in like the spectra auras and stuff like that where you have to attack it to pop it and it ends your turn it's that's when it starts to get really gross i wonder how vincent with the ability to just like pop all the wars at once will start to come in play if like enigma actually gets really strong that's true that does seem pretty unfortunate for enigma enigma might just have to like Oh, but that 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 is that is really gross. I was gonna say like maybe just play like a value plan where you don't build up a bunch of wards, you just like play one at a time. But then like even if you do that, if she your your two for seven isn't even a two for seven if they just blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just you have to play Iris of reality again. Oh no. <laughs> Remember, if you're an illusionist, you always have the option to iris people instead. <laughs> Oh no. Okay, let's uh move on and start talking about our last hero of the set. So the last hero of the set's named Zen, and he's a mystic ninja hero, and he only has one line of text. He just says once per turn instant, pay three chi, create a crouching tiger in your hand, search your deck for a card with combo, banish it, then shuffle. You may play it this turn. Uh let's I'll just read out Crouching Tiger real quick for those who don't know what Crouching Tiger does. Crouching Tiger doesn't pitch, it costs zero, and is a zero power ninja attack action. And it has ephemeral, so when it goes to the graveyard, it gets banished instead. And it has go again. We also need to talk about his weapon, which is Tiger Taming uh, Ka- Kahar. I, I, I'm not going to try and pronounce it. You should this know word. this. You should know this. Isn't this a Japanese word? Kakara? I think so. It has to be Chinese. Is it Chinese? I thought it was. Somebody was like talking about it like it was a thing. And then I was just like, oh, but maybe they were just like saying it with such confidence that I believed it was like a thing. They're like, yeah, I, I like I was like under the impression like it was like the name of this type of weapon. And I was just like, well, OK, it might be. I think it is a name of the type of weapon because it's called Tiger Taming, whatever it is. But it's by Buddhist used by Buddhist monks. It's a noisemaker used by Buddhist monks to frighten away animals. Oh, okay. I I think I know what it is. I don't know what it was called. I think that might have been what it is. I think I know about it too. Maybe it is Chinese. I don't think it's Japanese, but either way, let's talk about the card. Uh, this is a ninja weapon staff, which is two-handed, and it attacks for two. And it says, once per turn action, pay two resources, attack, go again. When this attacks, the next Crouching Tiger you play this combat chain gets plus one power. I called this on accident. I called this weapon uh, Crouching Ember Blade, and I think it's a pretty good name for it because <laughs> it, it's Searing Ember Blade, but like different conditions. It does. He kind of reminds me of Fi, though. Like you have this like two cost weapon with Go Again. You get the Go Again innately. And I guess it's never, I guess like it's like slightly lower value because you don't get the um, like the extra Phoenix Flame on top of it, but then like you get Zen's ability. So yeah, I don't know. It kind of reminds me of Fi with like the, the Crouching Tiger is your Phoenix Flame, but it's like also like a combo piece because there's like a bunch of cards that combo with Crouching Tiger is sort of like the missing piece here. And then you can tutor them with Zen is kind of like the the super rough idea of what Zen seems to be doing in Limited. Yeah, that's fair. I think Zen feels like a fixed Fi, right? That's that's how it feels mm-hmm. like to me. Essentially, each turn cycle, it's minus one damage compared to Fi because we're missing the Phoenix Flame. I feel like some of the combo cards really reward you for being able to activate its hero ability. Now the question is, How easy is it to activate his hero ability, and how detrimental is it to have to play a blue card before you play the Mystic Instance to transcend first? Yeah, I also have this question. And then I kind of went through like the thought process of, of like, maybe the answer is that you just play two of them at the same time. Like you like play one and then you respond to the other one because they're like both instants. And it's like kind of interesting, but you can only use his hero ability once. But maybe you do that. Maybe you like transcend card, transcend card, get two of them back, activate his hero ability, then like use the other one to pay for his uh, stick, his uh, his staff. 
Yeah, I think that is his high roll is when you draw two Mystic Instants together. Uh, and then you get to like play both of them, which also means that it can't really be a reaction, right? Because then that means you need another blue. So you'll, it'll need to be like a three blue hand if the Mystic Instant was like target attack, it's plus one power. Um, so they have to be very specific Mystic Instants for, for it to work with Zen. I, I guess the answer is like Path Well Traveled is gonna be super insane in zen since it gives target attack go again and if you played another blue card you can transcend and then that will combo with like the mystic actions that get power if you've played a blue so i guess you can do like drop like give it go again with path while traveled and then you've played like a zero for four off your blue base that has go again and you transcend that seems really strong but but you do need it like very specific and like well, Path while Traveled is a common, it's still legendary, so... Oh, but Droplet won't get the trigger, will it? Oh, it will. No. Yeah, yeah, because it's a static. Oh, it is It is a static? If you've played another blue card this turn... Oh, you are right, it is a static. Yeah, they're, they're all statics. They're all statics, actually. Okay, it's, it's kind of interesting because a lot of the Mystic Instants are legendary, which mm-hmm. means that you can't actually play multiple of the of the same mystic instance which typically means if you had like multiple of the plus one powers oh my god then like they combo together so you like it like works naturally well together but these don't do that yeah i think getting the go again is tricky with it yeah it's kind of awkward in like you have to play different versions of these mystic instance and try and get like the double chi triggers that way and I'm not sure if that's good enough, but sorry, what were we going to say, Yuki? I think you're going to have to be selective with when you do it and like how you use it. But I was just looking at something that I completely missed until just now. Is is Zen's ability an instant? Yes, it is an instant. It's an instant. So one kind of cool play that Zen has, it would require multiple of these transcend cards. So like maybe it doesn't come up that often, but I'm just looking at like rising sun, setting moon which has the draw a card, then put a card from your hand on the bottom of your deck. And if you've played another blue card, you can transcend. I just realized that you can use this card to bottom Crouching Tigers, which Zen's hero ability gives you. And you could also use it with new to bottom um, like Fang Strike or Slither and just like turn it into a card. You might draw it later, so it does have like some risk, but that's... That's kind of powerful. I just don't know how easy it will be to like transcend, play your hero ability, play this. Transcend again. You don't need to transcend. Yeah, I guess you technically do transcend again. But yeah, you basically just get to like play this, turn it into a chi, cycle one of your tokens into like a real card. It's pretty strong. Well, once you've transcend, it still pitches for regular resources as well, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just like a blue. So the, the biggest thing is that you need to transcend. I guess if you have like any other transcend instant, you can like what would you do? You would play this, play the other instant, the other instant resolves first, you pitch it into Zen, get your Crouching Tiger, resolve, rising sun, setting moon, put the Crouching, draw a card, put the Crouching Tiger to the bottom. It's pretty strong. Yeah, that is pretty strong. If you can do that, that's very strong. Except there's like a couple of cards like, you know, let's talk about Key Unleashed, which is a combo card, um, ninja attack action, uh, which for the red attacks for three, but when you combo... If Crouching Tiger was the last attack this combat chain, it gets plus four. Some of these cards kind of want to play Crouching Tiger, so I'm not sure if you even want a bottom deck your Crouching Tiger you get. Yeah, the biggest thing I was noticing with the deck from uh, the, the Blitz deck was that the, the deck sometimes struggles to use multiple Crouching Tigers in a turn. Like, it's pretty good at using one because, like, even the weapon just gives you plus one. But sometimes you're kind of stuck with multiples. So it's like potentially a thing that you could do. I don't think it's going to come up all the time, but it's it's interesting. I do kind of think Zen might just be playing towards having multiple of these instants. Like there's also like the plus one attack instant. So you could potentially like do the plus one attack, play another instant, get your blues back, transcend. It's pretty good. I'm not sure about this yet, but I kind of have a feeling that when this set actually like mellows out and we're gonna get to like you know like the mid part of the format i'm gonna be playing zen like pitch a blue 
four go again, two go again, five. And just like, I'm going to be doing the, you know, the Katsu from Outsider Strat of being like, I'm going to block for six, pitch a blue, attack for, attack for six every single turn. And I'm just like, that's all I'm going to be doing. I'm not going to play any, inst- like, I'm not even going to try and transcend. I'm not going to try and, like, combo. I'm just going to be playing Key Unleashed as a three block. I'm going to be playing all the other cards with Go Again just, just because it has Go Again. And I'm going to try and finish off the turn with a Grave Keeping, which is a generic one cost five power that just, I'm playing it as a generic one cost five power, no other text. And I'm not going to even bother with the Crouching Tiger stuff. Yeah, that's fair. Do you think that there's like a certain amount of that? It's just like, it feels to me, at least for now, trying to transcend feels more like a either either a constructed thing or just like it feels like it's gonna be too much of like it's too hard to try and transcend while keeping up on value and having like being able to do everything and being up on value seems to be hard because for a lot of these cards to transcend you need to play a blue card and to play a blue card if you've played any of the blue cards that I've seen so far, it's kind of below, right? And unless you can play like these like double instants and like combo like double blue card to have both cards become on rate, it's like it feels like it's too much work to make cards on rate. I'm not sure if it's worth it to get like the plus one power or plus two power on the cards just like to combo off with cards it might be good to have them in your deck so then you can like pitch stack it and do it late game but like i feel like usually i just want to play like you know maybe two or three mystic instants in my deck and like pitch stack it and then do it at the very end of the game yeah 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 i don't think you're going nuts on it i think zen probably transcends i i think i think enigma probably transcends the most and then, like, New needs to build up her Vanish for Transcend to be all that good. And Zen, I think, has, like, less compelling ways to enable it. So you will be doing it less. <clears throat> the thing that I do like, though, is, like, this mitigates Blue Flood. So if you have, like, a really blue heavy hand, you may be able to get... You may be able to get a decent amount of value out of it just through like the combination of like blue cards that get bonuses if you played blue cards and you know etc. Uh, you have double transcend cards. Um, you don't need all the resources. I, I, I think I think it gives you some protection from drawing too many blues, which can sometimes be uh, annoying as a ninja. You know what? That's fair. That's super fair. But yeah, I, I don't think you're gonna go like nuts and have like every transcend card that you see probably end up with like two two or three yeah it'll be interesting honestly this whole set seemed kind of interesting um is there anything else that you want to mention about zen before we wrap up the episode a couple of things is like key unleashed the two for seven if you've played a crouching tiger i have some questions about this card in the sense that like the two cost doesn't fit with the staff. That's four resources. So you kind of need to have like other cards that cost things or not attack with the weapon, which seems kind of bad because you're like playing a crouching tiger that turn. So that's like one thing that I'm curious about. It could be that like maybe Key Unleashed is like the card that you transcend for and that's like mostly how you pay for it because then you like you may have extra blues yeah i don't know i I think that you need to pay i think when you're building out this deck and once we see more of the commons and rares you'll need to pay a lot of attention to the curve and it wouldn't surprise me if it ends up being like phi where the one cost and the zero cost are what you want and even though key unleash looks really powerful and is a rare it it could be clunky it could be clunky it's possible you play it anyways but it does block three, but it could be... Yuki Yuki. The best part about this card is that it blocks for three. Yeah, yeah, it does block three. It does block three. For for my plan to work as blocking <laughs> for six and attacking for six every turn, you need as many three blocks. This is like an Outsiders, but in this time, we don't actually need zero cost three blocks. It can be any three blocks because Tiger Taming mm-hmm. doesn't require a zero cost in your pitch stone to get go again. It's just much easier 
have any kind of three blocks now, which is... That's true, that's true. Which is honestly, like, a significant upside. The blue key unleashed pretty good. Yeah, I think blue key unleashed is, like, is the sick one. Because then, like, it goes in your pitch stack, and then if it's in your pitch stack, you get to play these... Like, you get to pitch stack the double mystic instant, play the double mystic instant, double blue in- mystic instance and then get the chi activate zen late game make the crouching tiger and then key unleash for five just totally fine it's just like that's a good end game i think uh i think most of your like five shenanigans and limited for anybody that has played um uprising is probably going to translate here and honestly to some degree the katsu stuff from outsiders as well but but i think more directly high but uh but yeah i think a lot of the, the kind of ninja basics are going to translate pretty well to this deck yeah the only difference will be Fi was like play a one cost for four and then attack for three with ember blade was like a two card seven in this set it's gonna be a two card six because you flex claws into tiger taming it's only six power, so yeah. But if the flex clause hits, you get a crouching tiger, and then that's worth one. Okay, yeah. You know what? Yeah, yeah. I feel like when Fi got the Phoenix Flame, it hit for eight. Was like th- that. Ma- that mattered a lot. I thought. Yeah, it, it it's definitely a little bit lower ceiling, but I do think it's pretty good. I think all the breakpoints are going to be, and like the one attacks is going to be like kind of annoying for enigma as well potentially so it's interesting it's interesting i know that um i'll speak to this deck a little bit and constructed i feel like from what i've read just like randomly people are a little underwhelmed with zen and it makes sense like we got a lot of cards that are reprints some of the cards are like not super splashy or exciting i'm kind of curious to see what the rest of the cards we get for zen are because his hero ability tutors like I think just having like one or two good payoffs to tutor for could drastically change how the hero plays. And I also think in Constructed, a lot of these effects get a lot stronger because um, some of these things add Crouching Tigers to your hand, which means that you can Art of War them or you can uh, bottom them with E-Strike, which is like super powerful. Like his hero ability adds it to hand, for example, but it's not just Transcending. He also has... Um, uh where is it harmony of the hunt one for three go again and when this attacks if you've pitched a blue card this turn create a crouching tiger into your hand so so a lot of people are kind of like why is the crouching tiger valued at one you have to like use the staff to get the one value out of it so it's like a leg tap with hoops and it's like kind of true but this is also like a leg tap that you can use one of the power to like play an art of war or something which is pretty compelling so so i mean i don't know we have to see what's in store for zen i don't think he's there yet with all the pieces currently but uh i think he has some potential in constructed honestly yeah uh i'm glad you said that because i have a bunch of art wars right now that i'm sitting on and uh i, I, I really <laughs> wanted to spike <laughs> seems i don't know i i think that i don't know how good zen is in, is in constructed but i am certain that zen will play art of war Yes, yes, I think I think that's fair. I think that's fair to say. There's so many cards that makes Crouching Tigers to your hand instead of the Banish. And I feel like that was like the biggest thing that was like putting the Crouching Tiger decks from before kind of down was like a lot of them made a Crouching Tiger in your Banish zone, so you had to play it. This time it goes to your hand, so you can actually do like, you know, Enlightened Strike, Art of War, the cards that you were mentioning that like can utilize cardboard like just cardboard in general seems to be you know much stronger you also get like pouncing links as a super powerful thing that can get like tiger swipe or or like assault the wounds so you kind of like put your your opponents in this like weird fork where if they like don't block because they want to block the tiger swipe you can potentially like salt them for 10 or something but then if they block and don't play around the tiger swipe you can tiger swipe them and then kill them which is pretty strong um I also think that like some of the cards are kind of sneaky, like Biting Breeze is just a head jab that when it hits, you create a Crouching Tiger in your Banish Zone that you can play this turn. But like if you Art of War this and it attacks for four, and then it makes a Crouching Tiger and that Crouching Tiger gets buffed by Art of War, like it's pretty good. It's pretty good. 
Um, that's not even counting like other potential anthem effects for for your tigers, like his um, whatever his like special instant jade tiger domain thing is. <laughs> okay, yeah, but that's actually what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so so anime. But anyways, I, I think that Zen has some pretty interesting potential to just like be a fair aggro deck with like a pop off turn. Very very fi like. Kind of excited to see all three of these heroes in constructed as well as limited. Um, but we still only have like half the set spoiled so far, so you know, kind of excited for the other half of the set to come out. We also have like no, or very few majestic cards and no legendary cards. So uh, I don't know. Often a lot of the power budget is in those cards, and to see these heroes from their commons and a small number of rares already seem compelling is uh honestly kind of interesting exciting yeah exciting i'm i'm very excited for this set i think all the heroes look interesting i'm especially excited about new and enigma i think i'll be working on those first but uh zen also seems like he has a lot of potential and honestly like if any of these heroes ended up being a really strong deck and constructed it wouldn't surprise me with what we've seen currently yeah yeah it's very fair very fair okay uh anything else you want to say before we wrap up the episode i don't think so this set looks like a slam dunk very very excited to see the rest of the cards and for the rest of spoiler season to come excited to kind of like jump into limited and start talking about that format with everyone um hopefully we can do that in more detail next week but if nothing else like if you're trying to get ready for the world premiere, you're worried about time. Look at the Blitz precons and how they're built and use that as like a basic roadmap for like the types of cards you want in the deck, maybe like some of the ratios. And honestly, that's probably a very good starting point. And then you can like kind of tweak from there. But um, yeah, we actually have a quite a bit of information for the set going into pre-release. Like, and and world premiere like more than usual so um i think if you want to start getting ready for the format you can you can do that you could even start like proxying some of these cards and playing them into each other if you really really wanted to get an edge for the calling yeah i think one one card one thing to note for this uh world premiere is i think knowing what cloaked card exists in the set will will probably be one of the biggest edges you can gain for week zero of the format. So just, you know, make sure you know which commons exist, which which cloak cards they could have. And, you know, some of the... Like the ninja has a cloaked mystic ninja equipment. You know, know which one that is and what it does. And so for illusionists and so for assassins and just... Make sure you know which ones exist so then you know what can happen. So then you don't get randomly blown out and lose a game which you could have easily not lost. So I think that might be one of like the biggest um, percentage points you can gain just, just by learning some of the cloaked cards that exist in the format. And almost everything else you can like kind of read on the spot. Um, but at least the cloaked cards, it's not face up on the board anymore. So... You know, they are technically surprise attacks, and mostly for week zero, it is going to be a real surprise if you don't expect something. I agree with all of that, and also on that same vein, um, if you wanted to get to the next level, try to studying the instants and the reactions because those are also things that aren't face up. And this set looks to have quite a few tricks um, between like. Enigma having a bunch of instants, New having a bunch of reactions, cloaked equipment. There's just like lots of instant speed shenanigans in this set that um, I think if you're aware of like some of those possibilities, even just like the most baseline of like New has like a one for three attack reaction, but one of them is also a one for four is like something that you should know going into the set. Yeah, that's about it.
Awesome. Yeah, we can just wrap it up, Yuki. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, and thank you to all of our patrons. We really appreciate you. Um, very excited to be jumping into the new set with everybody and exploring all the new cards. If you want to be part of that discussion on Patreon, you can check us out at onthebobble.com slash Patreon and join the Discord. Um, there will be lots of people working on the format and talking about, you know, their, their thoughts on Limited as we're moving towards the world premiere. And um, for everyone else, we appreciate you listening. And you can find us on social media. Jay is at Ueda Jay. I'm at Yuki Lee Bender on Twitter. You can email us at onthebobble at gmail.com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, feedback, thoughts about the set, and so on. Um, until next time, best of luck parting the Miss Vale, and we will see you next week.